This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. I'm Steve Gould. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody. I want to thank right off the top, I'm going to start with Ilian Rogers, Tony Fahey, Corey Payne, Jacob Ruth, Rich Emery, William James Long of William James Long Investigations, Samantha Harbour, the great Gary Steiner, Richard Wilson, Scott O'Donnell, the great David Diaz, Timothy Wright. Thank you all so much. Those are the monthly subscribers to the show. They donate monetarily every month faithfully, and I um, I so appreciate it. You're, you help uh, help keep the lights on, help keep the boat afloat. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you guys, I love you. I'm in love with you. So, so, so thanks for that. And uh, secondly, second order of business is our new sponsor. We have a new sponsor, everybody. Hero Industries out of Corona, California. Um, Hero Industries makes all kinds of awesome stuff that supports law enforcement agencies and that you can use for uh, your agency. So do you have a fundraiser coming up? putting together an event and need something to help market it. Holidays are coming up and uh, you need gift ideas for organizing. <laughs> I'm a terrible, I should just make my own thing up. I'm terrible at reading ad, ad spots. Anyways, holidays are coming up. Do you need uh, ideas for your company organization? Hero Industries has you covered. Hero is known for their cute and adorable canine hero plushies and their stunning challenge coins. But that's not all they have to offer. Hero also has custom bottle openers, lapel pins, cigar cutters, tactical teddy bears, and custom badges. Any logo, any badge, any size, any shape, you pick how you want it. Just send Hero your logo and how you want it, and Hero makes it happen. Hero's excellent customer service makes it easy for you to design your item and offers a variety of accessories to pair with your order. Hero Industries has been working with law enforcement, government agencies, and canine handlers throughout the U.S. since the year 2000 by providing top-notch service with amazing details and one-of-a-kind products. Go check them out on Instagram at hero underscore industries underscore inc or go to the website um, hero-industries.com and check them out. Really is a great company. Uh, they're fans of the show. They listen in the office, which is very flattering. Um, and I'm very happy that they're sponsoring. And if you go to the website and you check them out, um, you'll see why they're the kind of company you want to do business with. If you're looking for law enforcement, um, stuff that you want your logo on your name, what, whatever, uh, whatever you're looking for, they can help you out They're They're, you know, family owned. There's a beautiful picture under the about section of the family, um, a husband and, and young kids. And, you know, they're pro police, they're pro copper. So these are the people you want to hire. You can hire the other big name corporations that pump out, um, can slap embroidery and challenge coins together and all that stuff. But you know, they're probably on the other, out the other door, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're sending out anti-police things. So with Hero Industries, you know that they're pro-police, uh, pro-America right here in California. So, uh, go with them. That's what I say. So this is episode number 89, the big eight, nine. We have a federal, a federale, a federal agent um, I think we've only had a couple before. Recently, we had one, and this guy is um, 30 plus years special agent DEA. Also, um, his resume, I can't go through it because it would be in a whole episode on its own. It's like if you, if it was papyrus and you unfurled it, it would hit the ground and keep rolling. If you, you'll, you'll see what I mean if you go to his uh, LinkedIn. Very, very lengthy. He not only was he with the DEA for many years, he while he's with them, he went through Army Ranger School for a special program for being deployed with uh, the military in South America, which is crazy and fascinating. Um, right now, he is here's the, his title now is quite impressive. He'll have to he'll have to break it down and explain it to us. Counter Narcotics Interdiction Business Development Manager for Rigaku analytic devices. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Um, but without further ado, let's get them, let's get them out of the green room. Let's get them on the podcast. And, Cause I'm sure Michael W. Brown has some fantastic stories. Mr. Brown, thank you for coming on. Steve, good to see you again. Good to see you, sir. I love the, I love the, I mean, if you're just listening on the podcast, you won't, you won't get it. But if you're seeing the YouTube behind Mike is, uh, an awesome, 
uh, wall of all kinds of stuff. American flags, awards, pictures with presidents probably, if I'm guessing. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, Mike, 30 plus years of the DEA. How do you, where do you start with that? Did you go right federal right away or were you a local city guy first? What, what's the story? No, it's, it's an interesting story. You know, uh, I had working through college my last three years, I was working in store security for one of the big um, outlets in Cincinnati, Ohio. And, you know, working with store security, playing close, catching shoplifters. You know, I'm sure you can appreciate that today with, with the, the mob looting oh, that's yeah. going on all across the country. You know, when I started out, you know, it, it, you get in a few fights, but, you know, you wrapped it up and you, you took a few people to jail and that was it. So, you know, working at store security, I had an opportunity to work with Cincinnati police prosecutor's office. And I found that uh, I enjoyed going after bad guys, even at, at small level. And, you know, in talking to some of the police officers, they, they were like encouraged me to look at the federal side, FBI and DEA. Uh, so, you know, I applied. And within six months of applying the DEA, I got a call. Um, someone had dropped out of the academy. A space opened up. And, you know, they asked me if I wanted to, if I wanted to go. So, you know, it took about two seconds to say yes. Uh, I dropped out of the first year of law school, Cincinnati Law School, and, uh, and went to Quantico, Virginia to start a new career. You dropped out of law school, Mike? What did the parents have well, to say about that? Well, I was like, I was preparing to go to law school and, you know, it was my mother's dream. Yeah. And I said, hey, mom, you know, I got to go follow this other dream. And she was like, what's DEA? And I explained it to her. <laughs> and she was like, are you, are you crazy? You know, you got to go to law school. I was like, that's just not where my, it's not where my path's going to take me. That's so funny. packed up a suitcase and uh, never looked back. How exciting for a young man, though, to get that call. Come on down, you know, go, go to the training federal agent. When I was a background guy for LAPD, the, just remind me of this. Um, I had a, a Korean candidate and, um, his, he told me, well, when you call my dad, cause you have to interview the parents, he's like, he's very pissed off about my decision. I'm like, Oh, okay. And his dad had a very thick Korean accent. And he said, he's supposed to be a lawyer. Of course. I, he's like, no offense, but I do not want him to be a cop. But um, that just remind, reminded me of that. So you go down there, you go to um, Fletzy, or they have, they, I'm sure they have their own training. The DEA has their own uh, academy. Well, at that time, uh, DEA was partnering with the FBI, so we're using their academy. And we're talking about 1989, uh, so it was quite some time ago. But DEA now has its own academy down in Quantico. Oh, okay. That's, so there's – I know Fletzy, like when I was um, – my first cop job was – on Cape Cod and we had a federal or a national park in the town and um, all their U S park Rangers went through Fletzy. And is that, is Fletzy kind of the catch all for all the other agencies that, that don't have their own Academy? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, if I think Fletzy's in Georgia too, you have, um, you know, uh, some of the other agencies, ice, perhaps uh, customs will go to Fletzy uh, for their training, but DEA, you know, like I said, we all now go to our Academy in Quantico next to the FBI Academy. It only makes sense. It's so specialized. You can't really, you know, get a generalized yeah, education on it. Yeah, that's that's really cool. So you've been DEA through and through the whole time. That's cool. That's correct. Yeah, long time. Wow. So, I mean, the life of a young federal agent, I'm sure they're, uh, I mean, I, I lightly looked into the NC, NCIS and um, right. I just started the application process and I, I withdrew because it was like, I'm a home, I'm like a mama's boy, homebody type of guy. And they're like, I just put down money to buy a house. I was 22. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're going to be, rent that baby out because you're going to be all over the world. I was like, uh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> but but fun if you're up for it. No, that, that was definitely the, the DEA career. It's, uh, you know, you pack a suitcase, you sign your nine, name, name on a dotted line, and, uh, you know, off you go. You don't know where you're going to go when you're in the academy, but you know you're going to go somewhere. And uh, it's basically you're starting your life over as a special agent. So for me, you know, having grown up in Cincinnati, conservative, upper class, middle, you know, uh, lifestyle, this was a big change. It was something I was really looking forward to doing. So, Mike, can you tell us about the first um, hot call or, or hot situation where you had an adrenaline dump as a, a DEA agent? Yeah, definitely, Steve. You know, I could tell you a couple of stories, but the one that comes to mind immediately, um, 
is at the beginning of the career, my career. I had just graduated from the academy uh, September 1989, and I was assigned to the Detroit Field Division. Now, as a new agent coming on the job, you know, you could not, I could not have asked for, you know, a better place to go learn the job than Detroit because Detroit had it all in terms of, you know, organized crime, you know, drug distribution, violent street gangs, and it was just a place where as a new agent, the first day you're going to go out there and you're going to learn the job which is what all agents sign up to do. I bet. I bet Detroit was a little intimidating, right? I mean, that's crazy city. I mean, Detroit's, you know, it's a great place to live. I don't want to knock it, but it did have some serious drug issues then. I think in 1989, it was one of the leading homicides uh, in the country, ranging around six to 700 homicides a year, <laughs> mostly related to gang and drug activity. But, uh, you know, today you look at Chicago, you look at Philadelphia, you know, the drug violence across America is completely out of control, and it's just getting worse. Yeah, it really is. So what was the call that really got you going? You know, so I'm, I'm 24 years old. I'm in my, my first group, um, just met my new partner, and, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, the job. You know, I've got on my, my blue suit, my new blue suit, my white shirt, and a pair of new Johnson Murphys, you know. I mean, dressed the part, and I had on my um, Sonny Crockett uh, shoulder holster with my 9mm Sig Sauer in it, right? Nice. So, look the part, I'm feeling the part. Yeah. So, my supervisor comes in, uh, Jimmy Coppola, right? Now, Jimmy is he's one of those old-school New York cops. He's been around forever. He's been, you know, old-school law enforcement guy who still carried a 38 5 shot on his ankle, nice. right? So, so, Jimmy comes in with his heavy New York accent. Uh, he looks down at my, my shoes and he says, Hey, I hope you can run in those shoes, Brown, because we're going to go out and execute some arrest warrants today on several violent crib violators who've been distributing crack cocaine in various uh, parts of the city. So Jimmy tells me and my partner, he goes, gear up. Uh, here's the arrest warrant location for your guy. Go down, set up surveillance and uh, wait for the green light to, to go in and make the arrest. So you know, me and my partner, you know, we get our gear, you know, we go down to the car, we drive to the particular area that we're going to do our surveillance, and we set up on this guy. He's on the corner, you know, and he's doing deal after deal. You know, so we're just kind of watching him, uh, you know, waiting for the, the green light to go in and make this arrest. So about 20 to 30 minutes after setting up on the location, uh, Jimmy comes across the radio to all the groups, say, hey, execute your your arrest warrants, right? So, so now the adrenaline pump kicks in. Oh, yeah. Like before you're just like, you know, you're on the job. You're kind of thinking it's going to be okay, but you really don't have an idea what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it's time to go to work, right? So uh, my partner jumps out of the car. I jump out of the car on the passenger side. And as I'm getting out of the car, I hear this loud sound of something hitting the ground. So I look down, and my nine millimeter had come out of my holster oh. and fallen on the ground. No. The, the clip came undone. Gun hits the ground. I see my partner. He's moving out to get this guy. So I pick up my gun. I put it back in the holster. And then, you know, me and my partner, we start running towards this guy on the corner. Now, as we're approaching this guy, he's looking up at us, obviously sees two guys in jackets that say DEA. So it's time for him to go. This guy, he bolts, right? Yeah. I mean, he's taking off. He's running like the wind. So me and my partner, we eventually, we catch up to him. Uh, we take him down, you know, and then the fight begins. He's swinging, he's kicking, he's trying to get away, and he's trying to put his hands in his pants. So my, my partner, who had been on the job for a number of years, is yelling at me, you know, get his hands, get control of his hands. Mm. So hands we finally get his hands. Hand, hands can kill, you know, and even more so today. Uh, so we're able to get him under control. We get his hands behind him. Uh, we put the cuffs on. I do a quick pat down, and I find uh, a few ounces of uh, crack cocaine in his pants. We take that out. We lift him up, and now we're walking him back to the car. So as we're walking him back to the car, people in the you know, crowd had formed, and then people started yelling, great job, great job, get the drugs, and get these gang members off our streets. Nice. Right. So the people are actually supporting the community came out and were supporting the arrest because these guys have been killing their community for years with distribution of, of narcotics, you know, violent crime and homicides. Sure. So for me at that point, you know, there was some validation that what what I had chosen to do for my career was what I was supposed to be doing, because hearing the crowd, you know, congratulating us and encouraging us to to help them make their streets safe. 
you know, it, it showed me that this is, I made the right decision. This is what I want to do. Yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, which is, which is the reason why people go into law enforcement, you know, we don't do it to get rich in order to get famous, but we do it to serve and protect. And, and that's exactly what we did that day. So all of the arrest warrants were made in various parts of the city. You know, we took some real serious players off the street, you know, for a little while, those streets were a little safer. That's awesome. That's a great story, Mike. I mean, that I, I don't, um, I'm a little naive to the DEA and, I, I, I didn't imagine that you guys would go after, like, I guess maybe because it was so bad in Detroit. Usually you, you'd think of, like, the city nar- narco guys doing that, but you guys at the DEA, DEA were there grabbing people right off the street, right off the corners. Oh, yeah, a little, little background on this. This was a, uh, a six or seven month investigation, including wire intercepts, oh, undercover okay. gotcha. drug purchases, informants. So this was the, the accumulation of a, of a very large high-profile investigation that we worked with Detroit Police Department and there were various other police departments and uh, federal agencies, kind of a task force setting, you know, to shut down, you know, a big part of the Crips operation. But on a day-to-day basis, the Detroit police are out there every day trying to make the city safer by going after these guys, you know, as they come in contact with them. But every once in a while, we try and approach the problem, you know, from a more organized, large-scale effort to have a bigger impact. No, that's awesome. That makes sense. Yeah, I should have I should have realized when you said you were doing these things at the same time, it was some kind of, you know, joint investigation right. that went on for months. That's that's awesome. And that's uh, what validation to get for your first intense, you know, like war- your first grab. The communities out there, and I'm, you know, later yeah, I mean, you, you saw that that doesn't always happen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, unfortunately, you don't see that happening a lot. It's kind of the opposite effect today for for some reason. But, you know, at least for me, uh, back in 1989, there was a lot of community support. People seemed to understand the importance of of, of community liaison with the police, of working with the police, and that the police were there to work with the community and, more importantly, protect the community. And that's still the mission of the police today. Yeah, absolutely. Um so Detroit back then, I'm just curious. I don't know nothing about Detroit except what I read and, and see. I've never been there. Now when I see, you see Detroit on TV, it's like this great American, fallen American city where it's like they show they show houses. They'll show like a firefighter who's still living there and working there, and they'll be like, yeah, I could literally buy my neighbor's house for $40,000. Like it yeah. seems, it's so awful, and it, I mean, is it make is it going to make a comeback? Do you think? Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it's hard to say. I mean, Detroit was a victim of a, a number of economic issues. Um, you know, the auto industry, as you know, it, it reduced its its work capacity. Um, people moved from the sub from the city out to the suburbs. You know, and that created a, a, a void for criminality to to really plan itself, you know, in the lower income areas of Detroit and grow. You know, as the drug trafficking and violence grew, more people left the city. So the tax pace left, the educations began to suffer, the businesses suffered, and then you have a ghost town in many parts of Detroit. You literally have mansions that have been sitting vacant for 40 years because no one's living there. These areas are just too dangerous to live in now. You know, and the gangs just have a very strong hold you know, Detroit has a, a lot of drug addiction, a lot of drug distribution. Um, you know, it's one of the major cities in America that, that has a serious drug problem, you know, and a serious economic problem, jobs, right? So you need, you need jobs, you need education, you need, uh, and people need to have a sense of a future. And when that yeah. sense of a future is removed, criminality creeps in and then can take hold. And I think that's what Detroit's suffering from now, like many other cities, unfortunately, in America. Yeah, and it's like a snowball because now the kids growing up in these bad neighborhoods, they <clears throat> the only the only thing they see they can rise up in is a gang. That's the only way they can get they can get respect, they can get notoriety is through a street gang. Well, I, I think it's worse than that, Steve. I think the, the kids growing up these are seventh, eighth generation kids who were kids of gangbangers, who were kids of gangbangers, right? So yeah. their their grandfathers were in jail or in jail. Their fathers were were drug dealers, murderers. And so what, what option does a kid have? Yeah. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're if you five years old and your father is a drug trafficker and your grandfather is in jail for drug trafficking and his grandfather was killed back in, you know, 1989, uh, your past pretty clear cut. This is what you know and this is what you tend to do. Um, just like kids whose fathers are doctors, they become doctors and their grandfathers were yeah. doctors. So, you know, the path for, for kids and families or closely associated with either the success or the failure of that family to set a path for their children. 
Yeah, it's so true. I, I actually, sp- when I was in backgrounds at LAPD, I, a friend of mine, Dee, she's a, um, a police officer there, but she's also a background investigator. And um, she was over lunch one day, she was telling me she grew up in um, essentially, you know, South Los Angeles and very, a lot of crime, tough place. And I said, you know, I don't want to be too personal, but how, how did you, you know, you, you, you're doing great. Like you, you made it out. Like oh, what's the difference between you and the kids that didn't? And she said, it was my parents. She said, they knew what was going on. My mom yeah. and dad stayed together. Um, they were strict. We were not allowed outside on the streets at night. And we went to and from school. That's it. But it was attentive parents and their family set the tone for the whole thing. And the whole family was involved. You know, like you said, it's like in that story, sure. that's the way they're, that was the lineage of their family. Just because they were in a terrible, oh, they could only afford to be in a terrible area. didn't mean they were going to participate in that and all you know her brother and sisters and everybody did well so i thought that was um you know it's like one of those core values i think we all know deep down that it's family <laughs> like having a good mom and dad together and having a good home that's it but that's it never um that's not really um championed enough in in the country you know we're back again we got some issues here got you back yeah i was just saying about the family in uh in america no, I was going to say one of my heroes, uh, you know, Colin Powell. Um, oh, yeah. Great American, great African-American. And, and he was born in poverty. And you look at what his parents achieved for him. Um, you know, he rised to one of the highest levels in our country as, uh, you know, the Joint Chief of Staff um, for the United incredible. States Army. And, and an incredible career in the military. So, you know, I kind of reject the excuse that if you're born in poverty, you, you have to remain in poverty. You know, again, it comes down to self-will, self-determination, and, and the will to achieve. And I think we live in a country that offers us, offers us those opportunities. Um, certainly for some, it's not as easy as for others. But I think the opportunities are there, you know, as long as a person is willing uh, to push forward, you know, and as the Rangers used to say, you know, there's no fight that you quit. You just don't, you don't stop till you win. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Mike, can you describe the strangest or most bizarre thing you dealt with in the DEA? You know, bizarre is a unique word. I would have to say the most um, disappointing situation that I, that I had uh, while working on DEA. I had been on the job for about seven years. You know, again, we were working on, you know, a number of high-profile investigations targeting large-scale drug trafficking operations that were operating, you know, out of out of crack houses across Detroit. So, again, you know, the group, we're, we're getting ready. We're working with a number of other um, state and local officers to do, to execute a number of search warrants um, at known crack houses. So, me and my team, we had one particular house, um, that we're going to hit. It was uh, two drug traffickers were using it as, as a distribution location and as a, a place where people could come and use narcotics. Um, it was a major issue for the city. So long story short, you know, we, we did our briefings. We got the green light to go in. So me and my team, we hit the door. We go in. And, and Steve, I mean, there were people everywhere, people using drugs, people passed out. It's a flop house. Uh, people sleeping. It was a flop house. And, you know, the two main uh, traffickers, they see us coming in the door, and now it's a free-for-all. They're throwing drugs. They're throwing crack everywhere trying to destroy the evidence. So it took us, you know, a few minutes to get control of the first floor. Uh, So once the first floor is controlled, me and a couple guys, we then move to the second floor to secure it. You know, and as we're moving upstairs, I mean, this house is like a special episode from Hoarders, right? I mean, it's just trash and human waste everywhere. I mean, I'm literally walking on a foot of garbage to get up the steps to the second floor. So as we hit the second floor, we come to the first bedroom. So, you know, I move in to clear that bedroom. And again, it's garbage and it's trash. You you can't see anything but just just garbage in this this room. So as I'm moving into the room, I hear a faint cry. And I don't know, it's like a cat. And as I'm moving closer to the window, the the cry gets a little louder. So I reach down, I pull back these clothes, and Steve, it's a uh, it's a little girl. She's about five or six years old, oh, no. and she looks totally malnutrition. So you know, we take her up, and we take her downstairs. You know, one of the guys was a medic. He's looking at her. You know, Steve, as it turns out, one of the ladies in the house that we arrested was her mother. She was a crack user, so she had come into the house to use crack, stashed her kid upstairs, and then went downstairs and passed out 
and just left her kid. You know, and having worked in Detroit for 10 years, you know, I can tell you almost every search warrant involved children. You know, children were the real victims in these situations. Um, yeah. You know, we work closely with child services to, to be on standby to come and get these kids out of these homes, you know, and put them in the shelters. But, you know, for me, that's not something the academy trains you to deal with. There's no class that, that's called dealing with traumatic children's situations, yeah. right? These are, these are things you have to learn on the job, uh, coping skills. Um, you know, so you just, you know, you train yourself to kind of isolate your, your emotions. But, you know, when you see a small child suffering um, in these kind of situations, it, it has an effect on you. So, you know, it was bizarre, but it was certainly traumatic in the sense of exposing me to to how inhumane um, people can be, and especially how inhumane parents can be to their own kids. Yeah, geez, those drugs really, they just, they just, they strip everything away from you. Because, you know, a mom would, that's the last thing any mom would do, is leave her kid no, alone I mean, in the crack yeah. house, you know? Sure, but that, that, you know, really tells you today the level of addiction, and I think we're seeing it even today, that the, the addiction to drugs is so strong, right, that people will forego their families, their loved ones, and their children just to get to that next high. That becomes the one and only thing that they're, that they're chasing. Man, that's devastating. Yeah, I have, um, as a police officer, I've been, unfortunately, I've had to be involved in removing um, kids from houses before with um, right. with DCF, you know, and oh, <laughs> it is, I'd rather do any other thing <laughs> in police work right. than yeah. do that. Um, that is just, and I can't imagine in the middle of a raid when you're on, you know, your, your heart's already pounding, you're on like uh, threat level 11, and now you got a little... Yeah baby like a little girl to deal with it's like sure. holy crap that's insane did you, did you, you know and we were hitting a house i'm sorry go ahead. i was gonna say did you did you um what happened to the girl did she get dcf probably or dss whoever And, you know, and, and, you know, of course, we don't we don't follow up with those those situations. But in most cases, the state winds up taking custody of the ch- children and putting them in foster care, you know, for, for some time. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the people that we arrested were were low level drug users and were simply let back out of jail on low bond or no bond, you know, and they're right back to another house the next week. So it's kind of a revolving door, unfortunately, at that level. Yeah, that's a, almost at that point. It's it's seems like it would probably be better for that kid just to just to get new parents <laughs> to be adopted, you know, into a different yeah. situation. Yeah, it's unfortunate, you know, and I think our system, we need to focus more on the children. Um, when we talk about the drug situation, we never talk about the children, which are the real victims here and how they're suffering. And I think we as a country, we need to really focus more on what are we doing to support children um, that are caught up in this this cycle of drug violence and drug usage. Because um, we seem, you know, we just don't hear about it. And it's not something we can forget. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Mike, can you tell us about your most intense and or terrifying call with the DEA? Yeah, this goes back to our earlier conversation when you mentioned Ranger School. Now, back in the early... Uh, 80s and through the 90s, DEA had a, a special operations program called SNOCAP in Central and South America. Now, SNOCAP was a special operations group of agents um, who trained and went down into South America and worked with host country special operators, um, basically be their special forces. But in order to qualify for this program, we had to go through and successfully pass Ranger School down at Fort Benning, RTB. Um, you know, and for most of us agents, you know, we're working desk and the next day you know you're in selection week you know running with 70 pounds of gear on your back wow. so out of the class that i went i went down with maybe 70 80 agents and we graduated i think maybe 20 um successfully passed the course wow now we don't do we don't do uh we don't do um we don't do jump school and we don't do desert phase but we do mountain and swamp phase you know and then of course all the other uh range of school training so, you know, I had been part of this program for about two years, and I was assigned to work with the Bolivian, you know, special operations group um, that were tasked with locating um, clandestine airstrips, um, drug storage locations, precursor chemical stash hubs, uh, and fugitives, all based down in the Amazon, the Amazon basin part of Bolivia and where Colombia oh, intersects. Sounds so, like a movie, Mike. Um, That's insane. 
Dude, you know what? I, it, it could have been, I tell you, Steve, it was, you know, again, and I'm, I'm 24, I'm 25 years old, you know, and this is just the top of the pyramid of my career. Even today, this stands out amongst everything else that I've done. So, you know, a team, we're about eight agents. We go down and we pair up with the Bolivian Special Forces group. You know, we're living out in the jungle. We're living with these guys. We're eating with these guys. You know, we're all part of that same team. So one particular day, we had some intel that a clandestine airstrip had been um, developed, you know, out in the jungle and that they were using small Cessnas to fly in, pick up cocaine and coca paste and then fly it out to another location. So we had the coordinates and, you know, we're, we're working with, you know, two what look like Vietnam era helos. Um, so when we split them up into chalk one and chalk two, you know, each helo had about eight guys on it. So, you know, we're flying out to, uh, to go hit this airstrip. Now, as we're coming in, you know, this is all triple can, you know, was incredible. So as we're flying in to hit this airstrip, uh, we see a Cessna that had, was overturned and that had appeared. You still have me? Yeah, yeah. I, I We were just on a lag for a second. So you're saying the... Can you still hear me? Yep. Yeah, so so as we're coming in on this airstrip, we see a small Cessna that had turned over and appeared to have crashed. And next to the Cessna were seven or eight guys who were who had um, standing next to a truck, which had looked to be maybe 70, 80 kilograms of cocaine in it. So as we're coming in, uh, these guys on the ground, they see us and they start shooting at us, right, as we're coming in on the helos. And, of course, my Bolivian counterparts are then returning fire. So as we're coming in, um, four of the guys jump in their red truck with the Coke or Coca paste in it, and they take off down the dirt road. So we split the two chalks into two different teams. Chalk one goes in, secures the landing strip. I'm in chalk two. We pursue the truck. Um, as it's speeding down this dirt road headed towards like a jungle clearing. So uh, we land. By the time we land, the guys in the truck had jumped out, and then they ran into the jungle. And again, it's triple canopy jungle. It's just all jungle. You can't see anything. Was there any moment, Mike, when you were were flying, did you ever think, what the hell am I doing? (laughs) (laughs) And Steve, the thought was, I'm doing exactly what I should be doing. All right, that's good. <laughs> that I probably should, I probably should have went to ranger school, and that's what I should have done for a career at that point. Um, so we're chasing these guys into the jungle. You know, as we enter into the to the jungle, uh, we hear rounds popping off. AK rounds are coming, and you know, you just hear them whizzing past you. So we return fire. Uh, we don't know what we're shooting next. We can't see anything. So we return suppressive fire. Then suddenly the firing stopped. Right, it's just complete silence. And we pursued into the jungle a little further, and these guys were ghosts. I mean, they were gone, right? They just disappeared, and obviously we had no idea where they were, so we weren't going to go too far in, you know, and get and get separated. So we found our way back to the truck. Truck had about 60 kilos of coca paste, right? It's the it's the process before cocaine is produced. You have the coca paste. So we're like, let's wire it up. We put some C4 on it. We pulled it. We blew up the truck. We blew up the coca <laughs> really? paste. Wow. Oh, we just we just detonated it on the spot. Flew back to the airstrip where they had arrested a couple of guys. Um, and the Cessna had a few kilos of uh, coke in it and coca paste. So we wired that, we wired up the plane, some C4, pulled the plug, and, and destroyed oh, wow. it. Wow. Um, and then we flew in what we call some some crater bunker busters. Right? These are large explosives that we plant into the airstrip. <clears throat> And we blew the airstrip up so it couldn't be utilized. So, you know, it was a full day, full day operational day, but a very successful day. But I can tell you the adrenaline was running for three or four days after that. And, you know, I, I ran I ran with that program for about four or five years. And I, I'd have to say it was probably one of the best programs DA ever had in terms of working with host country uh, counterparts where narcotics are produced. And we made a significant impact, but, you know, unfortunately, the program, it didn't last. And uh, after about five to six years, it was it was closed down. Mike, that's incredible, man. I, you're like, you're saying things that are almost unbelievable to me. You're blowing up planes and, and landing strips and holy cow. Um, I have to ask you, were, now this was Belize, you said? Uh, Bolivia. Bolivia. Um, Bolivia. Were, <laughs> did you tr- like, tr- how do I put this? 
were you guys in charge when you're doing this or were you at kind of like along for the ride with their guys? We're, we're acting as mentors and advisors, right? They take the primary lead, and, of course, we're there to support them in their counter-narcotic okay. operations. So, you know, it's definitely their operation, their authority. Uh, we're there to support their operations, much like the uh, the uh, U.S. forces in Afghanistan. They're supporting the Afghanis on their uh, war against terror. Okay, so, yeah, because I'm imagining, like, these junky old Hueys or whatever coming down and you being like, yeah. Uh, I really wish we had some U.S. choppers. <laughs> we could go in. So, like, we could have. Uh, yeah. Did they? Did they have um, to- weaponry that was up to date? Did they have like any equipment that was good, or was it all like super old and like junky? No, uh, you know, we worked with State Department and we worked with some assets of DOD who, through the military assistance program, you know, did fund. We yeah, bought this, the helicopters for them, um, bought the, uh, the, some weaponry, supplied, supplied funding for, for some modern weaponry. Uh, no, these, the Bolivian counterparts, uh, these special ops guys were, were highly trained. Um, you know, I put them up against, you know, some of our guys. I mean, these guys lived and breathed in this jungle. You know, this is what they did 24 hours a day all day long. So, you know, they knew every aspect of that jungle and these guys were hardcore. I mean, you know, sleep on the ground. I was impressed. I went down there thinking, you know, these guys aren't going to be, you know, they're not going to be very effective. We're going to wind up carrying all the water, but uh, no, very committed, um, you know, to the job. And, you know, we found ourselves trying to keep up with them. Really? That's cool. Um, Yeah. My uncle worked for Raytheon government division for his career. And he got at one point, I think he was in Columbia (laughs) And my aunt hated it. She was with him and they had like, um, they had guards all the time. The Colombian government provided them with yeah. armed guards at their little hacienda or wherever they were. Like they were kind of like in the mountains a little bit. And, um, yeah, mm-hmm. he would never was too specific on what he was doing, but we knew he was there doing something to do with weapons guidance systems or something. But, um, those, those, government the everything down there feels like it's like, like a banana republic you know what i mean like it's like yeah what what are they crooked are they not are these good cops are they bad cops like it's like i knew a guy um who i used to work with on cape cod town next to us his dad was a brazilian cop and he said they used to get laid off all the time because they'd run out of money and then they would just lay off the police force but then they'd hire him back in a couple months but i said well what, right. did, what did all the cops do and he said well a lot of them did like construction or like carpentry or whatever. And he said a lot of them were crooked. They would just go around, use their influence to get money because they had no money. And they figured it was their right to do that because the government wasn't paying them. And I thought, whew, we are, I'm happy. We're in, I live in America, (laughs) you know? Yeah. No, I mean, that, that definitely was a concern of ours. But, you know, with this program, we U.S. government really supported these units with supplemental pay, training, you know, all in the condition that people who were assigned to unit would be in the unit for at least three to four years before they could be transferred out. So we were able to build that stability within a unit and that trust. Um, you know, and again, in the five years that I worked, you know, I, we put our lives in these guys' hands every day. And I have to say I was, I was very impressed and never – you know, when I first started, sure, there comes some, but after you do a three or four operations, you know, and these guys are on the front lines, you know, taking fire, um, you know, they're, they're committed and uh, that you're safe with them. So Mike, you're saying five years, did you, did you get to go home for breaks or were you pretty much living down there? No, every three months we do a three month deployment. Um, then we go back to our divisions, you know, various agents from different parts of the country go back to the divisions in three months, we go back down, but each time another group would come in and rotate. So there was consistently uh, a DEA team on the ground or multiple teams on the ground in various countries for at least four to five years of the existence of the program. Wow. That's interesting. So what, um, say you're, are you ever off duty when you're down there, when you're on operation or is it like, could you go out and have a night on the town, let's say? Well, some of the, some of the towns, you know, we were based out of a small town called Trinidad, small cow town, beautiful people. You know, they had a couple chicken shacks, a restaurant and an ice cream parlor. So when we weren't deployed out in the jungle, you know, one week, two week operations, we'd be back at home base, you know, training, catching up on the paperwork and then redeploy with our guys, our teams, you know, as the operations came up. But, uh, you know, we were, you know, we had operations in Chimare, Santa Cruz, uh, Trinidad, we were working all throughout that country. So really wasn't a lot of downtime, 
uh, you know, some time to go back, get some new gear, and then go back out. Because in three months, it's not a lot of time. So you're trying to do as many operations as possible to utilize your time in the best way. And there's certainly no lack of work. I mean, you know, Bolivia today is one of the largest producers of coca paste and the coca plant which they then moved to Colombia and Peru for refinement. So, uh, you know, there was always some work to do somewhere. Yeah. Jeez, uh, I, here's a question I've been meaning to ask a drug guy. I keep forgetting to. Um, I hear stories from just from the training I go to of people, like as a last-ditch effort to get away, when you go into a house or, or wherever, people throw drugs in your agent's faces or cop's faces. Have, was that a thing that you saw, people throwing heroin or, or coke like in the air up at you to try to distract you no you know today even when i was on the job you know uh, the few one or two incidences um we hit a house you know somebody points a gun over their shoulder fires a few rounds you know i was fortunate and i was never really in in any of those direct uh, threat situations but uh, i never saw an individual you know throw drugs at an officer but today with fentanyl yeah. What we're seeing is that the traffickers know that it's it's airborne, it can be ingested, and if they throw a kilo in the air up at you, uh, you can die immediately. You know, our police officers today on the front line, it's not like the old days, you know, when you go into a drug house, you make an arrest, and you're picking up kilos with your hands. Basically, every drug operation is a hazmat operation now because fentanyl is so deadly. You, a police officer cannot approach that situation with a, with a very laxed attitude, he has to be ready because he's entering a hazmat chemical situation where his life can be ended just from the inhalation of narcotics. Most likely, someone throwing it in your face. You know, in my opinion, someone throws drugs in your face now. That that should be an attempted attempted murder charge right there off the bat. Yeah. Because it could have fentanyl in it, and if it certainly has fentanyl in it, that should be an attempted murder charge uh, right off the bat. I mean, we've been fortunate. We haven't seen any officers, you know, get killed or seriously injured. But, you know, the way crime is evolving and the uh, the dislike for police officers, you know, it, it could happen in the very near future. Yeah, I just had a, a two-day class on um, uh, clandestine labs, and they talked about all the precursors and the um, <laughs> some of the cases they went over were like, it's like a nightmare scenario. Like the guys go in, you guys go in for a raid. And then one of them, they found a fridge and it had like um, a bunch of unlabeled liquids in it and they had crystals growing out. There was explosives. It was, you know, it was highly, you know, if you knocked a jar over or even tried to open it, that would have been it. Um, But none of the, it's not like these guys label stuff, you know, they're, they're, they're crazy people. They're, they're, they're lucky they're not blowing themselves up more often, you know? No, and that's one of the things, you know, uh, now that I'm working with Regaku, I had the opportunity to work with him in Miramar. But, you know, Regaku designed some very high-end uh, ramen scanners that can detect and, and determine what those liquids are. So a lot of police officers now across the country you know, are using this advanced um, interdiction identification technology to identify these chemicals. Yeah. Because right? you go into a house, you know, it could be a meth house, it could be acetone, it could be sulfuric acid, it could be sodium cyanide. You don't know what it is, right? So... With these scanners, they can now identify these substances without touching them, without removing them from the containers. You know, and again, you know, you need the proper equipment. And and today, you know, science is really the answer to a lot of the drug enforcement issues that we have. Advanced technology to counter the advanced technology of precursor chemicals and drug production. Um, You know, it. The days of, you know, fighting and, and beating down bad guys, it's still there, but they have evolved and it's up to law enforcement to continue to evolve as well. That's interesting you say that um, about the Rigaku. I wish I'd paid more attention to what they, the the brand names they were talking about, but they're, I know my county, the state police have, the clandestine lab team for this county has um, a meter thingy and <laughs> for, better, for what you're talking about. And one of them, they have a couple different ones. They're like in big Pelican cases and it has yeah. a database of things in it. And there's, I think the most 50 right. most common are preloaded. So it gets it right away. And then it will right. go into a longer process to identify if it's not in the top 50, it will go through and, and try to figure it. And d- does it do it by passing a beam like light or something through the liquid or? Right. I mean, the Rugaku, it's called the CQL um, 1064 ramen laser. That's what uh, it is. It, it was ramen. Yeah. 
Yeah, and ours is about the size, it's a little larger than your hand, and it has a chemical library of about 13,000 different chemicals to include you know, chemicals of mass destruction, well, um, uh, precursor chemicals for drugs, and explosives. So the way it works, it shoots a laser beam into the particles. You know, and each particle, whether it's coke, heroin, or methamphetamine, reacts differently with a different color spec- spectrometer. Um, and then the machine can read that color print out and tell you exactly what that chemical is or that drug is literally within seconds you know back when i started on the job we had the uh the small packets plastic packets um the reagents yeah you break right? them into the you, different color purple them, and blue and you shake and... them up right exactly yeah. yeah i can't tell you how many times i've used those and the plastic breaks and i got chemicals and drugs all over my hands you know false positives happening all the time sure. but if we had had if i had had that the regard that cql that technology you know, I could identify, you know, are we buying good drugs or are we buying bad drugs? You know, do we need to spend more money and buy five kilos or should we go arrest this guy who just gave us a kilo of baking powder, right? right. So, again, the technology plays a key part for law enforcement today, you know, in determining you know, what is it exactly we're dealing with here. Is this something that's going to kill us uh, or is this something that we can manage? And if so, how do we properly manage it? That's right, yeah, because when you – I remember in this in the seminar I took, they, they said – uh, fentanyl that's like 10% is considered 100% pure fentanyl because it's cut. But if it's 10 per- something right. like that, you probably know the number better than I do. But with a device like this, you can actually tell how much, what's cut, like what the percentage is, like how much of this is real heroin, how much is real, how much of this fentanyl is pure type of deal. Yeah, it, it really, it can't break down the percentages, but it can certainly tell you, you know, if you've got cocaine with some fentanyl in it, it can identify, okay, this is cocaine and this is fentanyl. Um, and that's enough, okay, that, that tells you, okay, we have to deal with this a certain way. But, you know, that's really the important thing. Um, you know, and the CQ also has what it calls a quick quick detect swipe. And it's basically a, a small swipe. You can swipe a surface, a steering wheel or a table, and then put it, the laser up to it, and then it's going to kind of tell you the trace amounts Okay, maybe this is fentanyl, maybe this is cocaine, you know, if you're looking at a house or a car, you know, and then you can develop your probable cause, do search warrants, and, and continue your investigation. But but really, I, I see the, the this use of technology. I think it has to be something in every police officer's toolbox when he's on the street. Absolutely. That that is really cool. That Ramen is that is the one they mentioned during the uh the training that they have, I believe, the state police here. We right. had um I actually have the handout right here. It was um Oh, you know who was one of the speakers was a DEA chemist from New York City. So okay, yeah. um, fascinating to hear that guy talk. I mean, oh, the, they know it all. Oh my gosh! And the um, yeah. the stuff they do in the lab is he he gave us kind of some of the um, some of the outtakes maybe of, you know like they're like they get a lot of freedom to do stuff mm-hmm. and they've taken stuff outside of the parking lot before and done right. stuff and. No, at one point the side of the building got lit on fire, and they're like, "We didn't, you know." But um, crazy, that's a mm-hmm. crazy job, and they're dealing with. Um, I mean, it's New York City. There, it's it's like a insane, constant flow of of drugs, like a, oh, yeah. a like a tidal yeah. wave of drugs all the time. And he said they'll when they're in the lab once in a while or a few times in his career, he's they've identified something, and it's been like. You probably know it better than I do. One of those chemical compounds that, like, if you move it wrong, or if you jar it, it could explode. That type of deal. Like it was right. mixed in with the drugs, and then they have to like lock the whole lab down, slowly back away, come back with big suits on, and just. Sure. Um, I don't know. That doesn't sound. <laughs> that sounds like all risk, no reward to me working in a lab like that. Like I'd rather put the handcuffs yeah. on somebody yeah. <laughs> than just deal with that. Right. But God bless them. I mean, that's how law enforcement, yeah. That's how law enforcement's changed. Again, you know, back in the old days, you know, you walk in, you, you put the handcuffs on and you seize the drugs. Now you have to go in and it has trained hazmat teams in, in almost every city. Um, 
in the course of production of methamphetamine, you know, fentanyl, um, the backyard, bathtub labs, they're still there. I mean, they were they went down for a number of years, but, but that's coming back uh, with the precursors coming in from Mexico and chemicals coming across the border and, you know, meth production being set up in various states across the country. Uh, so now, you know, again, as your DEA agent or state and local, you almost have to have or you should have some hazmat training uh, to understand these situations. So when you go into a situation, you know, you're not popping bottles open and putting them up to your nose and saying, oh. hey, what is this? Because, you know, that's that's going to kill you. Right. So yes. it, it's a new day. For law enforcement. Yeah, and we're actually, where I'm, the part of Massachusetts I'm from is that the fire departments are on board too. They're going to like yeah. the, the yeah. same training because, um, you know, these one pot meth, um, little meth container, I mean, I don't, people don't realize that they make meth in a two liter bottle, soda bottle, and they get like the, they use the soda stream ones because they're a little thicker for, mm-hmm. they won't explode, explode as easy, I guess. But they demonstrated to us how to, they get it, that rolling like boil in the two liter. It's like this rolling chemical reaction and they'll hold the frigging thing in their lap when they're driving. Like there's been traffic stops yeah. when like they look down and there's like a one pot just coming up to a boil. And it's like, what do you do with that? It's like, get that away from me. You know, it's, it, it's insane. Right, right. And how are these people, how are these drug addicts smart enough to be like, you know, chemists? It's like they're, they're making this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that's the amazing thing. You go on the internet right now and you can download one pot methodology. Um, you know, it's very simple. I mean, anybody really, you go to your, your hardware store, you get some acetone, some kerosene, yep. you know, maybe some uh, other household chemicals. Uh, mix it together wrong, you blow yourself up. Mix it together right, you know, you make a few dollars and you get some methamphetamine out of it. Yeah. It's high risk. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, Mike, do you have a, a positive or heartwarming encounter? This is a question a lot of cops struggle with. <laughs> yeah. I would have to say, you know, I, I would have to say, um, you know, one of the most heartwarming aspects of being an agent actually occurred um, in a non-agent capacity. I was, uh, 2018, I went to Miramar. I was the uh, DEA country attache for the Rangoon country office. You wow. know, Miramar is located next to uh, Bangkok and uh, Vietnam and is probably the world's largest producer of methamphetamine, um, second largest producer of heroin. So they have a, a major, major drug problem uh, in Miramar. So over there, I worked with host country counterparts doing strategic planning and implementation. But as part of uh, the embassy community, the U.S. Embassy had an outreach program that worked with uh, orphan orphanages and, and children that were being raised by the Buddhist monks. So the embassy would put together funding, op- funding opportunities Cloney food, and we would get gifts, and we would go to these various orphanages, you know, to, to work and play with the kids. So this was my first year. I think it's 2018. You know, I, I sign up and volunteer to be part of this outreach program, and I go to this um, this orphanage that's run by these Buddhist monks, and it's it's for all boys. Boys and girls are separated. Um, so immediately, I walk into the room, and there's like 30 to 40 um, small boys, you know, ages you know two to 15. And they're all just staring at me because they've never seen an African-American before, right? Oh, really? So, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I walk into the room, and the kids, it goes from noise to dead silence. So the translator introduces all. There's like five of us from the embassy. The translator introduces us, you know, and they, this is Mike Brown. He's DEA. He works with the police and these drugs. And then one of the kids raises his hands and says, what color is he? Who, what is that in Miramar? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the translator says, no, he's from America. You know, he's African-American. Americans come in different colors and shapes yeah, and sizes. Yeah. And then so I walk up to the kids, and they kind of move back a little bit. Then they come a little closer, a little closer, and they touch my arms. I got some tattoos on some sleeves here. Yeah. And they're rubbing, and they're touching. And then they say something to Miramar, and he's like, he's okay, he's okay, right? And then they all just come rushing at me, and they're talking, and they're touching, and we're laughing, and we're playing. <laughs> uh, and it was a phenomenal experience. I spent the whole day there with our team. You know, we brought some lunch. Um, we had some toys. We sat down and, and read books, did coloring, played games. Uh, it was a phenomenal opportunity. You know, I was so impressed uh, with, with these kids. I actually looked into adoption, but uh, Miramar doesn't allow foreign nationals to adopt um, oh, wow. their children. But, uh, you know, I went back, yeah, three or four times I went back with the outreach group and participated 
But it, it's just heart heart wrenching because these kids, you know, these are the unwanted kids uh, in Miramar, right? These are yeah. kids that were abandoned at birth or kids that were just parents couldn't afford them and brought them to the monastery and says, Hey, you know, take care of my kid. And, you know, there's not a lot of state funding to support these kids, you know, so they don't have a lot of clothes. They don't have the medicine that they need. Um, you know, it's just like you want to do more really, but you can't. So you do what you can, you spend time. And what's amazing to me is none of these kids were crying. Not one kid I ever heard complain. You know, they look at their situation whether they understand it or not, I'm not sure, but, you know, I, they just seem so happy and full of energy in life. And, you know, I was grateful I had the opportunity to spend that time with them. But, you know, through my capacity as country attache, you know, I had that opportunity through our foreign um, agent program, you know, to go to Myanmar, become part of the culture, become, you know, um, to make friends with, with local Myanmarese people and, and really, you know, adopt the personality of the people I'm working with, which was a phenomenal opportunity. I would say one of the best aspects of DEA is the opportunity to go overseas and work in various countries, which I spent maybe 13 to 14 years of my career working in various countries across the, across the, uh, mostly in central and Southeast Asia. Man, that's awesome, man. What a great story. That's so funny to think about with, um, because you're African American, they were like taken aback. Because it's, you know, America is such yeah. a, we're such a melting pot. It's it's easy to forget that a lot of countries in Europe and in in Asia, everybody is similar, uh, homogeneous or what, what do they call right. it when everybody's like similar looking and it's like all the they, they share. homogeneous homogeneous yeah they're so for, in America it's like mm-hmm. we're the melting pot so every there's like. Every race and ethnicity is represented pretty much. Um, right. So that's. I wonder what. I wonder if they would have something to say about like a super white guy with an orange beard. Would they be like, "What is that?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, "Hey, what's going on?" Right now, great kids though, but uh, you know they don't have TV, they don't have radio. Their exposure to the to the world is is non-existent. Um, they they know what you know Africans are. So the first question is, you know, are you an African? But the concept of African American is completely unknown to a lot of people in South. Yeah, that makes sense. Asia, and it makes then they're like, "Oh, you're black, Billy had black Americans." It, it's a completely different um, perception from being perceived as African or being perceived as a black American. They make a distinction. Gotcha. That's interesting. Um, wow, that's really cool. That's. Um... I didn't expect you to say something like that. That's 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 awesome. That the it's nice to see the DEA has a, a kinder, softer side. Oh, absolutely. We have a very diverse portfolio. I mean, we have uh, we have women um, agents and country attaches working in Southeast Asia. You know, working in the Middle East and countries where it's traditionally men. Um, we're very diverse in our outreach programs. Um, the, the concept of equity is there, and everybody gets a chance to participate you know, in these programs, it's, you know, you volunteer, you put your name in a hat and then you go through selection phase, you know, and and they pick the best people for the best positions. Interesting. Yeah. That's awesome. Did the, um, did they have, when you're dealing with the Middle Eastern countries and stuff like that, where typically like these kind of roles would be male, did they, would you guys ever just like make sure to have a male agent? Or would would you say nope? It's the female agent that's her area, or you know what I'm saying? Like, because we're like, I'm I'm asking yeah. because when I was doing backgrounds, I was doing a background on a guy in L.A. He worked for an arms company, like a big. They sell arms to all different countries, and when I was there, this huge facility in SoCal, um, it was like it was like uh, Stark, you know, from Iron Man. It was just like that, like the right, lobby right. and insane money and. Um, his manager, he was, this kid was in a specific division that was just guys and he dealt with the Middle East and she said it, it has to be that way because they won't, it's, she said it's just much harder to do business with them when it's a woman. So unfortunately, everybody we have that deals with the Middle East is male and that's, that's the section he's in. So I thought, I was like, wow, okay, that's another thing you never think of. You know, it's like we have, um, America's pretty, you know, progressive sure. that way. So I was wondering, like, with the DEA, when you're dealing with different ethnicities and or different um, cultures, does it, would they ever make sure to have a male agent rather than a female to make it just work better? 
You know, I think you have to, when you look at private corporations, they look at it differently, um, where their, their end goal is, is profit in most cases. <clears throat> so they're going to do what's most profitable for the, for the company and the, the least path of resistance. Right. You know, but for the government, um, we're working through a U.S. embassy, so all countries know America's stance on equality. For example, I worked in Pakistan for 10 years. Uh, and my One of my the ambassadors was Nancy Powell, phenomenal State Department uh, ambassador. She was an ambassador in Pakistan for a number of years, highly respected by the Pakistanis. Um, and State Department had a number of uh, high-ranking women as well who worked directly. You know, when you're working at that high diplomatic level, um, it, it's – there's really no difference between male and female, right? Because everybody understands how the politics work. Whether you're male or female, you have to get a job done. Um, and, of course, even on the Pakistani side, they had some females in high-level positions as well. Um, go to UAE, Saudi Arabia, of course, it's different. But each country in the Middle East is different, and you have to put together the right strategic team. Um, certainly, if, if you're a woman working in Saudi Arabia, you have to be respectful of the culture. How much of that did you miss? Um, start again when you said Saudi, like when you're dealing with the Saudis – yeah, certainly, you know, uh, even, you know, the, the women that we have within the the embassy who work in Saudi Arabia have to be respectful of the culture. They have to cover their hair. You know, you wear a pantsuit instead of a dress. Um, you know, even for the men, you, you cross your legs. You don't cross your legs. You don't put the soles of your feet facing up against an individual because that's perceived as disrespect. So, interesting. Uh, you know, you go through certain – you go through any – training you go through cultural training and they teach you how to interact and and do what to do and what not to do but um it's never been a situation as far as i know where the nbc said you know hey we can't send uh we can't send a woman to a particular post um because she's a woman well that's good to hear um yeah i'm sure you go to all kinds of um like you know cultural fork and knife school right to learn a little bit before <laughs> they just throw you in there yeah, I mean, especially when you're going to, you know, a, a Muslim country, like when I went to Pakistan, you know, I took it upon myself to learn the culture, to learn the greetings, um, you know, and just the general respect, uh, which they, when you're, which they appreciate, you know, you're not that ugly American, uh, right. you know, you come in and you show the respect for the culture and you get mutual respect back and it just makes the job a lot easier. That's great. That's cool. So Mike, one of the like really popular questions, one of the more popular questions I ask is advice for new police officers. So in your case, it would be advice for people looking for that federal job. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of police officers out there that convert and there's a lot of people that go straight for the feds. And there's also a lot of people that come right out of the military and go right to, um, federal agency. So what's some advice you would give to uh, young agents out there? You know, I think anybody considering a, a you know a job with a, the federal agent, whether DEA or FBI, uh, specifically DEA, is that they really sit down and they think about what they want to do and really understand what it is and what DEA is all about, because it quickly becomes uh, a twenty-four hour lifestyle. I mean, you're going to be away from home for days at a time, weeks at a time. You're consistently on the go. Um, sometimes you can't tell your family what you're doing. You can't tell your wife what you're doing. You know, I can remember, uh, you know, many, some of the relationships I was in, uh, getting a call at two o'clock in the morning and you're like, Hey, I got to go out. I can't tell you where I'm going. And it quickly becomes, Hey, are you having an affair? Are you cheating on me? Yeah. It's like, no, I just can't tell you what I'm doing. And it, it can cause a lot of problems. Sure. Um, you know, and of course, when you sign your name to a DA contract, you can be moved at any time under their move clause. So, you know, are you ready to move away from family? Can you live away from your mother and father? If you're married, is your wife going to let you move away from your family? Um, you know, there are all these nuances about being an agent that that you simply don't deal with as, as a state or local police officer. The concept of stability, right? I've had in 32 years, I've had 10 moves, Ooh. right? 10 moves in three different houses. But I enjoyed it. For me, personally, it was, it was a great lifestyle. But I know other agents who have been in, say, Houston for 24 years and never left. And that's where their family community is. So they were fortunate. But, you know, if you join DEA, and you want to progress, you want to become a manager, you want to become a special agent in charge, you're going to have to make those sacrifices, make the moves, work the late hours, do the travel overseas, uh, and commit yourself almost 100% to the job. You know, and of course, it's, it's much more dangerous than it was 20 years ago. You know, police officers, I think, what, more than 50 police officers were killed last year? Uh, and now as a federal agent, you're putting yourself directly in the sights of the bad guys when you're hitting, doing search warrants, doing arrest warrants, managing undercover operations, 
doing surveillance, right? Doing so. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I pull my gun out on surveillance just to keep from getting carjacked in Detroit. Yeah. Um, so there is a there's a 24 hour danger moratorium, you know, on, on being an agent. And I don't want to over over exaggerate it, but certainly there are things you have to consider today. Uh, when you're walking on the street and you're carrying a federal badge that you don't have to consider um, when you're state or local. You know, and what I would say is, hey, don't become an agent. You know, if you're looking to carry a gun, if you're looking for glory or you're looking to feed your ego, because those are the guys that sooner or later cross the line and find themselves in jail, you know, or divorced or out on the street with no job and no future. So, you know, you make your wish and be careful what you wish for, um, because it's a serious it's a serious 24 hour job. Yeah. Yeah. You're, I totally see that a good friend of mine went deep into the process, of the DEA and, um, was right at the job offer part. He's a cop. And, um, he had to look at that, that like, okay, well this seemed like I wanted to do it. And then on the East coast, anyways, the New York city is like a vacuum for the DEA. It's like, that's, right. that's just where you're going. You're going to New York city. Just going, man. And then New like, York city, yeah. when he's talking to his buddy, who's already in the agency and he's there, he said, not only are you coming here, you will be fighting for the next 10 years to get the hell out of here. If you don't like it. Right. You go, cause it's, they just need so many agents here. So I think yeah. that, and like he had bought in a house and he's a great mm-hmm. asset to where he is now. He ended up staying and it was, it's a blessing for the town he's at. But, um, yeah, he had to really face those. You know, it's not um, it's not the movies. You know, it's this is your life. You're you got to be ready to go. Yeah. So well, yeah. well, we're lucky to have uh, men like you, Mike, that that sign up for it and take the ride and getting you know 1969 Hueys and fly through the jungle chasing an old pickup truck full of heroin or yeah. coke or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> very cool, man. Wow, what an interview. Um, that was a lot of fun. Where can um. The, the ramen that we spoke about by Rigaku, where where would folks go to? How would you get one of these? Because they're not they're not like a, something you go into the store and buy. You got to. No, you can uh, you can either reach out to me at uh, Michael Brown at Rigaku That's R I G A K U, or you can just go online uh, R I G A K U and look up Rigaku directly and see all the items um, that they have, uh, especially related to um, counter narcotics, um, the CQL prodigy and some other devices that are many police departments are adopting as well as you mentioned fire departments hazmat teams even first responders um because you know it's all about chemical identification you know and staying safe today that's awesome okay so i will i'll link all that in the show notes and i'll also put it it will go up on the website people can um find you there and and look into uh purchasing that equipment so i know i know that is one of the go-to um uh, devices that we use in, in my county. So it sounds like you guys are quite well established in the leader of the pack in that, in that venue. Yeah. You know, we're also branching out into the health and, and human services. You know, we're trying to establish partnerships with drug prevention outreach programs that are, you know, out in the street, um, interacting with mental health and drug abusers to, you know, to make them safe as well, giving them the tools to do pre-drug screening and work with drug addicts and, you know, and get ahead of this, this fentanyl issue because in the first line, first line responders, they're the ones who are really going to be facing, um, the, the situation with some of our police officers out there today. Absolutely. Michael W. Brown, thank you so much for coming on, my brother. Great interview. Steve, appreciate it. I'm going to do the thank outro you, here, and can you just hang in the green room, and I'll be right with you? Roger that. Great. Hey, guys, that was episode number 89. Woo! That was a crazy one. Um, wow, that was fun. That was a good one. I like these. I like these. Uh, it, it, it's funny, when you, have a, when you have a podcast and you start looking for people to come on, they come in like groups, so... I started out with um, local and city guys a lot and then some state guys and then back and forth with county and local. And then now some uh, federal guys are starting to come on and it's a whole um, another perspective of law enforcement. That's just, I think is super fascinating. Um, Really fun. Thank you so much to Michael Brown for coming on guys. Thank you for the continued support. Please keep going to um, iTunes and rating and reviewing the show five stars. If you can leave a comment, 
That's awesome. Uh, I'm like a, a schoolgirl when I see that I have a new rating or review on iTunes. I get very excited. If it's five stars, I get excited to read that and uh, it makes my day. So thank you for doing that. And it, it really is um, helping to put the podcast on the map. When I go, when I send an email um, out, if I'm after a guest or looking for somebody, they do go to the their their manager or agent or them they themselves will go and they'll see the podcast and they'll see oh it's got 562 reviews and it's rated 4.8 out of five. That's part of the decision making process if they're going to come on. So like um, you know guess the caliber of Michael Brown come on. Um, it I keep getting people like this because of the the reviews and, and your support. So um, please keep doing that. If if you love the show, if you really love it. Um, I'd encourage you to go to thingspleasesee.com and donate. Um, you can donate monthly or just do a one-off. There's, uh, there's merch there. You can buy t-shirts and mugs and all that other stuff that's there as well. So, um, yeah, that's it guys. Um, thank you for, thank you for hanging out and I'll see you next time.